Hello and welcome to our part one, where we will be describing common endpoint attacks. With this first one here being a buffer overflow style of an attack, where on the client side application, the application was written to expect a certain input size. And if that input is exceeded by, again, a buffer overflow, the application starts to behave in an interesting manner. Now, the reason why I say behave in an interesting manner is I've seen these over the years where some applications simply lock up. Some applications, the service will stop. But some unfortunate applications with true vulnerabilities could give, for example, command line access where we can then do several other steps that we're going to go over as we make our way through this topic. So again, just keep in mind, this is going to be one of a style of an attack that could then lead us into other steps to overall compromise the end system. Now, the question might be, well, how were you able to identify that this application suffers from this kind of an attack? Well, it could be actual debugging tools with inside of the programming language used to create the application could be good old-fashioned trial and error or specific concerted steps to attack it from a brute force or using a brute force mechanism. The next one or next category, if you will, is going to be malware or malicious software or mal malicious bad software. So this software, keep in mind, comes in many different forms or styles. As the book is saying here, the uh, viruses, worms, Trojan horses, and they've been around for quite a while. I still remember the Morris worm, sometimes known as the internet worm. I, I rarely ever heard it called that. I've heard of it and referenced it most as the Morris worm. But my goodness, in my opinion, two things happened when this came out in late 88. Number one, the attacker's eyes were opened as to all of the possibilities available out there. And number two, the the administrator's eyes were opened as to all of the changes that are going to be happening in their their day-to-day -day work, again, to protect their systems. I want to be clear, this is a list of some examples of common worms over the years, uh, but again, by no means a complete list. And I just want to go over a couple of them that I remember that, again, kind of uh, bubble right to the top. For example, the I love you. I still remember walking into work that morning, I believe it was a Thursday morning, and getting tens upon tens of emails saying, I love you and thinking to myself, you know, I, I know I'm a nice person. I try to be a nice person, but people don't like me that much. Now the non initiated into security opened up that email and the malware attached spread itself to all of your contacts in your address book. Other people, again, who did not open up the email uh, were not part of the, the, the spread of that style of an attack. Another one of, of a special note is NIMDA. You might remember this one. It's actually admin spelled backwards, SQL Slammer and Sasser. I want to stress again, I've unfortunately encountered all of these, but these were the ones, the three or four that popped to the top when I think of, again, common long-standing worms throughout the years. Now understand that what this worm is ultimately trying to do is stay under the radar and provide the attacker with remote access to the infected system. And once the attacker gains access, maybe they can again do reconnaissance on the compromised system or even reconnaissance of the network the compromised system is connected to. Now, before we go too deep, I want to be clear that a lot of these, uh, these approaches, these techniques, these mechanisms are going to be reviewed from an attacker's perspective. But please understand that some of them can even be used from an administrator. So what I want to do is kind of go over this slide a little bit backwards first, because again, so much of our time is going to be spent focusing on the attacker's perspective. So please understand Administrators, the benign intended people, they can use a reconnaissance style of uh, tools and techniques just to see if their security policies that they've put into place are working, to see if they have any exposed systems that they previously were unaware of, or if any exposed systems are actually vulnerable to known uh, exploits. 
Now, with that being said, let's go back to the top of the list here where attackers could use some well-known services or applications. Some of my favorite ones is going to be NS Lookup to gather DNS information that might be publicly published, public information, and then also a who is to see who is that, what is the publicly accessible IP address of my system of interest. And the most important thing is once we have access, let's say by way of an IP address gathered from the who is command, then we can go through and identify by doing port scanning any open ports and especially services that are running on those open ports. Not only well-known services on well-known ports, but even well-known services on non-standard non-registered ports. Now remember, these are all different tools and techniques. One of the things that I'm trying to do is slowly kind of build a process or build a story as we make our way through this. So this next approach of gaining access and control, I want to stress there are many, many different ways that we're able to gain access and gain control. Uh, for example, over the next couple of uh, minutes, we're going to be talking about several different ways of doing phishing. So I'm going to leave that for a conversation coming up really soon. Other ways, and I'm going to stress here before I even move on, it seems like unfortunately the human is often the weakest link. Most, most often, I should say, is the weakest link. For example, using password spraying with well-known accounts accounts that are default to an operating system where the administrator either did not disable that account or they did not change the default credentials. For example, my goodness, how many operating systems out there have a default account of admin or a default account of administrator. So go through and change the default credentials. If you're not able to change the default login name, maybe consider with a very, very strong password, or even, for example, with things like guest accounts or services accounts, consider even turning off that account altogether. And then, of course, once the attacker has access to that endpoint, there are many, many different things that the attacker is able to do. And I want to stress, we're just going through techniques and procedures. We're going to go over several options, for example, botnet as one of them that is available once again, once the attacker gains access and control to the end system. So once again, as promised, botnet, a botnet is going to simply be a collection of computers that have been compromised. Those systems, compromised systems are referred to as zombies simply because they have one task, a one track mind, and that is to do whatever the master control mechanism tells them to do. So again, they will be robots for this botnet performing the operations, which could be a distributed denial of service, for example, against a public service, maybe a public website. Now, hands down, one of the most popular ways, as I mentioned earlier, to compromise a system or compromise a network is unfortunately through the human. The human is very, very most often the weakest link. So that's where social engineering becomes very, very popular and hands down the most common approach for social engineering is phishing. And give me a moment when we go over some of the details, but there's a lot of variations and a lot of terms that revolve around phishing. But the idea here, high level idea here of phishing is to fool the human into thinking they're going normally to an internet connected service by maybe using a logo, but when they click on a well-known logo, it goes to a URL that is most certainly not where they want to go. Or when they click on the URL, because the humans, you know, we have to use our eyes, we don't see that, oh, it's a slightly different spelling, or maybe there's a dash where I've never seen a dash before. So the idea here is to trick the human using social mechanisms to going to a system that has been compromised. So as I mentioned earlier, Phishing is just more of a general different uh, word, if you will, with many, many different types of attacks that fall under phishing. For example, and, and by the way, let me pause for a second before we go too deep into this. I like to use the words to help me understand the words. 
times. So spear, when I think of spear, I think tip of the spear. I think something that is very sharp, touching a very small point or a targeted, in this case, phishing emails against a targeted group, maybe of a specific interest. I'm going to keep doing it over and over, folks. Whaling, well, to me, whale, huge, large animal, larger surface. So still the idea of targeted emails, but now to a much larger target or attack surface. Folks, farming, specific websites or farms of websites that are used to lure the unsuspecting victim into accessing that website, normally through a compromised DNS server. And then we'll talk about this coming up in a few more minutes, but getting malicious code to that unsuspecting user. Watering, again, is going to be the idea of farming, yes, but more specifically for web servers. And then we start getting into some specific phishing mechanisms like vishing or phishing over voice. I cannot tell you even while I'm doing this recording how many different random text messages I'm getting. Again, which would be schmishing. Love that word. But again, uh, how many different phone calls and voice messages I'm getting from the IRS, again, here in the U.S., where I need to call them right now or my benefits will be lost forever. So be careful with this. I want to say it one more time. The human is most often, unfortunately, the weakest link. So once again, going a little bit deeper into the phishing conversation, compromising known legitimate DNS servers. So when the user, the unsuspecting user, is trying to go to the valid URL, that DNS entry that was compromised, or if you will, poisoned, is actually going to send the unwitting user to an attacker website, an attacker resource, because of the, the DNS, the A record entry, for example, that has the wrong information or is poisoned. 